30 years ago, our eyes to the universe came into focus. We've seen the beginning of galaxies, the deaths of stars, and viewed deep into the past. But it wasn't always like that. The Hubble Space Telescope got off to a very rocky start, and blurry start at that, making it the butt of late night jokes. So how did a unique mission in 1993 bring us to the images we see today, and what's next as, like us, it keeps aging? Humans have long attempted to understand what they were seeing over their heads at night. The night sky and the Milky Way have long made people look up, and over millennia, humanity has tried to understand its place in the universe, and in the greater scheme of things. Thanks to Galileo, we could peer deeper into the heavens from right here on Earth with the invention of the telescope, but Galileo couldn't imagine what would come next. With the space age came new possibilities. A large space telescope in orbit would not be hindered by the blurring effects of looking through thick layers of air in Earth's atmosphere. While even the best ground-based telescopes can be limited in resolution by atmospheric turbulence, a space telescope would only be limited by the mirror diffraction and could achieve a much higher resolution. A space telescope also would be able to operate around the clock without being rained or clouded out. Earth's atmosphere also blocks most infrared and ultraviolet light, as well as gamma rays and X-rays. Observatories in space would have access to the entire electromagnetic spectrum, limited only by their instruments. And scientists were eager to find out what they could see that was invisible to the naked eye. As it turns out, that's quite a lot. Some of the first orbiting observatories like OAO2, Uhuru, and IRIS revealed a whole new universe beyond what we can see. So NASA started the Space Telescope Program during the late 1970s when it was approved and funded by Congress, with the European Space Agency joining in to get around that limited NASA budget. In the late 1970s, construction had started on what would be known as the Hubble Space Telescope, set to launch into orbit and be serviced by the still in development at the time Space Shuttle. The telescope's 94-inch mirror, almost the size of the mirror on the Hooker Telescope on Mount Wilson in California, would be by far the largest one flown into space, along with five instruments that were developed to observe in visible light, near infrared, and near ultraviolet. Speaking of Mount Wilson and the Hooker Telescope, astronomer Edwin Hubble confirmed the existence of galaxies and the fact that the universe was much, much larger and not limited to the Milky Way through his observations of what was then known as the Andromeda Nebula, which we now know as the Andromeda Galaxy from that telescope. As a result, the Space Telescope was named after him in 1983. The initial launch date of 1983 had slipped to late 1986 due to issues with the contractor, but the telescope had been finished and was not far away from being shipped via the Panama Canal to its launch site at the Kennedy Space Center when the Space Shuttle Challenger and its crew were lost in January of 1986. While upgrades were made to improve shuttle safety, the launch date slipped from the fall of 1986 to the spring of 1990, when the Hubble telescope was ready for launch. On April 24, 1990, STS-31 and its crew aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery successfully deployed the telescope over 600 kilometers or 380 miles above the Earth. However, there was a problem. A problem that had been ground in to the telescope's primary mirror a decade earlier. Something so small, it could only be caught once in space, as flight controllers at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland tried to focus the telescope. Hubble was diagnosed with spherical aberration. Basically, Hubble was nearsighted, and it was discovered that the mirror had been ground to the wrong shape. The flaw was only 1 50th the size of a single human hair, but that was enough to cause rays of light entering the telescope not to converge on a single point of focus. Now the telescope could still do science, but did not have the expected diffraction limited performance required for its groundbreaking research. Jay Leno even joked that it wasn't Hubble that was out of focus, but that the universe was out of focus. Oh, I wish I'd have come up with a pun like that. 
The good news was that the issue could be fixed. It just needed some contact lenses. Corrective optics could return Hubble to its promised performance that astronomers were really looking forward to. And there was an ace in the hole, the space shuttle, which was regularly flying again. The Hubble telescope had been designed to be serviced on orbit. A servicing mission had already been planned for that same year, 1993, and was part of a scheduled service maintenance every three years or every 300 billion miles. Uh, okay, maybe the miles part was made up. The 1993 mission now took on a huge importance to NASA's future, especially due to the many and varied problems the agency had already been facing in the early 1990s, ranging from post-Cold War budget cuts that threatened to plan space station freedom, which is now the ISS, to setbacks on other programs like the botched mission of Mars Observer because of an issue with its propulsion right before it was about to enter Mars' orbit. 10, 9, and we have a go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and we have liftoff. Liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. On December 2nd, 1993, Space Shuttle Endeavor, the best space shuttle, blasted off from pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center with seven astronauts and a whole bunch of pallets holding repair equipment and instruments to correct Hubble's vision. The STS-61 crew were all veterans of previous space flights. They cross-trained on each other's tasks as they prepared for five EVAs, or spacewalks, in five days, a record at the time. Okay, you sort of slowly worked yourself out. I've got your feet. Okay, you can just pull me out, Jim. Okay? I've got you. Watch your right hand. Okay. I have you. Okay, pull me away. Okay. The astronauts would work in teams of two, alternating between days. Meanwhile, a third mission specialist stayed inside to help move parts and people with the Canadian-built robotic arm, cleverly known as Canadarm. But Endeavour had to get to Hubble first, and needed to grapple the ailing spacecraft. Besides its well-known optical flaw, Hubble suffered from pointing issues as well as a jitter of the solar panels every time the spacecraft crossed the Earth's terminator from day to night, or vice versa. This jitter, caused by temperature variations, caused the telescope to lose its lock on targets. Though not nearly as much in the public eye as the spherical aberration, the jitter and pointing issues with the gyroscopes were equally as mission critical, which was why the first EVA would install new gyroscopes and the second would replace the solar panels. On December 4th, Hubble was lowered onto the flight service station, which made its debut during the Solar Max repair mission in 1984, and the AVA crews got ready to go to work. Greg, you'd probably see the kink in the plus C2, uh, plus the outboard by stem. We see that story. We're looking at uh, camera Bravo view here. They also noticed a kink in one of the solar panels. Stay tuned for that. The first order of business was to give Hubble six healthy gyros for aiming the telescope which worked during that first seven hour, 50 minute long spacewalk. At the time, by the way, that was the second longest NASA spacewalk ever. Next up was the replacement of the observatory's solar panels with new ones that hit insulation on the deployment guides to eliminate or greatly reduce that jitter. And the kink in one array that I just mentioned? Well, that reared its head when it came time to retract the old solar panels for return to Earth. While one solar panel had successfully retracted, the kinked one decided it didn't want to do that. So during the EVA, Catherine Thornton tossed the damaged solar array overboard to later burn up in Earth's atmosphere. Hey, I'm ready. Okay, they say you gotta go for release. Expect 20 pulses on your IC. Hey, no hands. And there's gonna be 20 pulses on the IC for ready. a set burn. Okay. The old one that wasn't busted was brought back. Now came time for optical repairs in the form of two new instruments. The first instrument, and the next one to be installed, was the Wide Field and Planetary Camera 2. This grand piano-sized instrument had its own corrective optics and would take place of the original. All right, stop. Let's just look at the uh, labyrinth field. My side looks good. Stop. 
Okay. Next came that second instrument, replacing an old photometer with CoStar. This box had two corrected mirrors for each of the three axial instruments. Now these instruments had pairs of mirrors mounted on small robotic arms that would direct corrected light to each instrument. The astronaut successfully installed CoStar in place of the HSP and upgraded the telescope's DF224 computer system with additional memory and an Intel 80386 coprocessor with a lightning fast clock speed of 16 megahertz. Oh, technology's come a long way. One final spacewalk remained. They replaced a solar array drive and built covers for Hubble's magnetometers as a way to prevent debris from getting onto Hubble's new eye on the world and made sure they were all mounted on the telescope. In total, over the course of five days, the crew spent 35 and a half hours outside of Endeavour working on Hubble. Now the Hubble Space Telescope was redeployed on December 10th, and then came the big test. Did the repair work? Is it? Oh, yeah. Whoa! Hey! hey, hey, hey. One to the bright right picture. there! Oh! oh. oh. I'm sure you know the answer at this point, based on the stunning and in-focus imagery we're still getting from Hubble to this day. But what in particular has Hubble taught us now? Spoiler, it's a lot. Hubble confirmed the existence of black holes in the mid-1990s, and also confirmed that black holes make up the heart of almost all galaxies. The Hubble Ultra Deep Field in 2004 showed galaxies all the way to 500 million years before the Big Bang. One of Hubble's most important findings is that the universe is not only expanding, but its expansion is also speeding up, and that this speeding up is due to dark energy. Hubble has also found that galaxies are embedded in clouds of dark matter, which is matter that we cannot directly see, but we know it must exist because galaxies lack enough mass to heat themselves together without falling apart due to the laws of gravity. Five additional service flights added new instruments and capabilities, including greater capacity for infrared observing and smaller solar panels that added more power than the older ones. That most recent repair, by the way, was 2009. With all of those repairs, none of the instruments that were on the Hubble Space Telescope when it was fixed on STS-61 are still aboard the observatory today. They've all now been replaced and are back on Earth after subsequent servicing flights. Speaking of servicing, even though the space shuttle fleet is retired and in museums, a new plan has been brought forward by Jared Isaacman, the private astronaut who has flown aboard Crew Dragon on Inspiration4 and is commanding the Polaris Dawn mission. Polaris Dawn is testing new privately developed spacesuits for EVA work and will feature the first ever private spacewalk. These suits, or a later development, could well be used on the next servicing and reboost mission to the Hubble telescope. He talked about the possibility of a new Hubble servicing mission during the Polaris 2 flight in a discussion with NSF's Jack Beyer. This is not the uh, you know multi 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 billion dollar asset you know kid gloves of you know 30 years ago tw you know 20 years ago. So it's coming home uh, at some point or another. It's either coming home uncontrolled, where there's going to be some some you know small risk to person or property, or you're going to spend like stupid amounts of money to go up and make it a controlled re-entry. You do an EVA, you know, there's a, there's a lot of risk in that. It's like, we're doing an EVA on Polaris 2, guaranteed. We will evolve the capabilities from what we learned from Polaris 1. So that risk is being taken no matter what. Do you want, you know, this amazing asset to just be healthier when we put it into a higher orbit or not? I should note, NASA has not yet approved of this plan. After 10 to 15 more years of use though, a Starship flight could bring Hubble back to Earth for a display in the Smithsonian. If you can kick that, that bad boy up and give it another 10 or 15 more years of, of life, it is totally within the realm of possible to go up and bring it down on a Starship. Everybody who's a naysayer today because of whether it's, you know, their own, you know, protecting their own personal contributions or whatnot to that telescope can take their grandkids and see it in the Smithsonian. A Crew Dragon could dock to Hubble using a docking ring installed on the last repair flight in 2009. The docking would be from the Crew Dragon's trunk in the back, leaving the front available to fire thrusters and act as the exit point for spacewalking. And in a timely reminder of Hubble's age, gyroscopic issues have actually put the veteran telescope in safe mode just in November. 
so that return or repair of Hubble is even more important now than ever. So you've probably heard of the James Webb Space Telescope, the so-called Hubble replacement, but Hubble isn't gone yet and continues to do science to this day. It's gonna be exciting to see Hubble and James Webb pictures all still coming in, and we'll be sure to share them with you of any really cool ones here at NSF. I'm Sawyer Rosenstein, later nerds.